Uh, let's go ahead and go to 2 Peter chapter 2. Um, when when I, we were down, and I'm, I'm going to remind you of this a lot, but, uh, but when we were down in Destin, and, and it was 40 degrees when we were in Florida, some people go to Florida and it's 81 degrees, but other people, when we go to Florida, it was 40 degrees out. Um, but uh, we were down there uh, in the mornings. Uh, in the mornings were the quiet time. All my, all my chitlins uh, were sleeping and they're quiet and they're trying to uh, recover. And, uh, and so I'd get out there and I'd just kind of just have a quiet time. And, and uh, I just felt like the Holy Spirit told me um, that at the beginning of this year, he wants me to kind of refresh some things. Uh, in other words, what kind of what can happen is you can you can have certain things preached that you're like, okay, it's foundational, that's important, that's essential, and then you keep moving on to uh, to I don't want to say other things, but other things, and and people can start they can come in, or you can get on with other things, and you forget those things that that have been taught at the beginning. And, and uh, I just really felt like I needed to treat faith and covenant. And in the, at the beginning of this year, it's not, I, I don't think, I don't think it's going to be a full year. Listen, folks, when I, God gave me the assignment uh, years ago to teach on covenant, he said, I want you to teach on covenant relationships until, until I tell you to stop. And I preached on it for 52 weeks. And I mean, every week I taught on covenant relationships. And when, it, when he allowed me to move on, I was like, all right. And then a couple of years later, he said, I want you to teach on healing until I tell you to stop. And that was more than 52 weeks that I, 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 I taught it every Sunday morning. So, uh, so when he tells me, I want you to kind of, I want you to get on it and, and, and start the foundation I'm, I'm saying yes, and I got this, hunt, I got this feeling that it's, not, it's only been a couple months because I'm, I'm a serious kind of guy, uh, but, but we're whatever the Holy Spirit has for us. Uh, but I think what we talked about last week, and I, I'm just going to kind of try to run through what we covered last week as quick as I can, um, but, in, but uh, most people in relationship to what they're believing God for is they're trying to get God to do something for them. God, why won't you give me this? Why won't you do this for me? And, and, and the truth of the matter is, 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 and I said this last week, is that a, that's a very futile prayer. It's a very, it's a very, uh, it's a prayer that just is not, is not going to get a lot of answers because it, again, if, if, uh, if my children, um, after they after they had opened their gifts on Sunday or on Christmas morning or Christmas Eve or whatever, they opened their gifts and then just sat there and begged Dad for their gifts. I, 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 I do you understand how frustrating that would be for me to watch to watch Ryan or Allison sitting there flustered because I, I would really yeah, Allison Allison opens up I don't know if it was that sweater but she opens up a off white sweater. And, and then she sits there and has a tear running down her face. I just really would like a white sweater. Oh, I really like an off-white sweater. <laughs> Dad, would you please get me a white? I done did. Your tears aren't moving me. They're frustrating me because what I've already provided for you, you're not enjoying. You're not understanding what I've done for you. And and uh, and over in First Peter chapter or Second Peter chapter one verse three, it says, "According as His divine power hath given, hath is past tense; it's already been done unto us most things, some things, a significant number of things, all things that pertain to life." And spiritual matters. He hath already given to us. When did he give it to us? On the cross. He gave to us all things that pertain to earthly life. He gave us peace. He gave us joy. He gave us he gave us uh, uh, healing. He gave us prosperity. He gave us he gave us salvation. He gave us all those things that pertain to life. And in the spiritual realm, he gave us all things. 
That's what life and godliness is all about. So when we're, when we're begging him, and, and again, it, it goes on, through the knowledge of him, what you don't know will hurt you, that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of his divine nature. Well, Pastor Thad, that's talking about heaven, except that it's in context to life and godliness. Folks, I'm telling you that here on this earth right now, sitting here in this room, going to work where you work, living where you live, shopping where you, can, where you shop, driving where you drive, going where you go, you can walk in his divine nature. You can live in what he's provided for you on the cross. Beloved, we're not, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Oh, goodness gracious, folks. At that day, it's going to, anything on this earth will pale in comparison. But until then, God, Jesus, on the cross, through his death, burial, and resurrection, has done everything necessary for you here on the earth to walk in and with, in his divine nature, and to live like he did. Jesus did what he did on this earth, not just as something for us to go, he's someone to be worshipped, but he did what he did on this earth for us to understand that if we will do what he did, we can have what he had. Acts, t- Acts 10, 38 tells us that, that how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, who went around doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, For God was with him. If God is with us, then the works he did will do, and greater works will we do, because he went to his Father and he sent his Holy Spirit to us so that we could access, we could do what he did. When he was baptized in water and he came out, they saw the Holy Spirit descend upon him Floating down like a dove would float down on him, but it was the Holy Spirit. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't a dove. He just floated down like a dove would float down. It just hovered down, and 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 the Holy Ghost came upon him, and then he began. He began began operating the way he operated because the Holy Spirit was on him. God was with him, and he did everything. Now he went to his Father, so we can now have more than three and a half years to accomplish what he did in, in three and a half years. And we are the body of Christ. You say, what does that have to do with anything? Is that there's a lot of us that should be accomplishing what he accomplished. Let's say there's a million, and there's probably more, maybe a billion, born again Christians across the face of this earth. Do you think in one day, a billion born-again believers should, yes, I said that right, should at least do some of what Jesus did in his life on earth. So how much did Jesus do in one day? Did he heal 20,000 people? 30,000 people? It says many times that he healed the multitudes. So that could be 20, 30, 40, 50,000. Well, if there's a million of us, don't you think, don't, don't get nervous in the service, folks, okay? I'm just, I'm, there's sometimes they just things rise up inside of you and you share it. Don't you think that we as the body of Christ over the face of this globe should be seeing people healed on a daily basis? And if millions of us are seeing millions of people healed, on a, then we've already, we've surpassed what Jesus did on any one given day. Anyway, all right. 
All right. But so <laughs> I don't know why I went there. But he's given us all these things that pertain to life and godliness. They're for us. We've, they've been placed in our account. We talked about it last week that because we're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, they're imputed to us. They've been placed in our in in uh, in, in our lives because of righteousness. Uh, go over to Romans 4. I'm 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 going somewhere today because I want to get to this next section that I just kind of I I, I quickly glossed over at the, at the end of last message, but I want to get into it a little bit because um, it's going to help. It's going to help a lot of people. <clears throat> but when it's talking about Abram, Abraham, in in chapter four of Romans, um, oh, let's see here. Let's just let's just read verse 17 and we'll go from there because it, it's it's all so good. But it says, as it is written, I've made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. And we're going to talk about that hopefully a little bit later today. But that's faith, calling those things that are not as though they were. So in other words, if healing, if you've got in your body some sickness and and, and, and healing is not what you see, then you still speak the word over it. You speak healing over your situation, not what you see. So the stuff that's not is those it was already done. Verse 18, who against hope, <clears throat> he had no reason for expectation, believed in expectation. He placed his faith in expectation of what's going to come, that he might become the father of many nations. He couldn't have kids. Didn't make sense that he could, should expect anything. God said in, in Genesis chapter 12, he said, go to a land I'm going to show you. I'll bless thee. I'll bless those that bless thee. I'll curse those that curse thee. And thee, all the families of the earth we've blessed. And, and, and all this kind of stuff. And he, and, he, and he said all this kind of stuff. And, and he's, he's sitting there and he's thinking about the years that he's had it at not producing any children. And it didn't make sense. But when he got the word from God, he held on to the word and took the word. And so against hope, should have been no hope, he still believed in hope. Uh, that he'd be a father of many nations, which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Verse 19. And this is, this is we gloss by this. We gloss by it. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old. So when he was 75 years old, he got the promise. And he started walking. And I, I, like, I like how my... Dad would say this. He would say, he would say, a lot of the actions he had uh, was at least a stagger. You'd at least call it a stagger when he uh, when he called Sarah his sister. It was at least a stagger. When 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 he had relationships with her handmaid, it was at least a stagger. And so people go, who well, said he didn't stagger for 25 years? No, it says when he was about 100 years old. It gives us the time period. He stood for 25 years, but at, but at the at the hundred year mark, after 25 years, um, he says when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness. So all of a sudden, his faith kicked into a new level. His faith operated at the level it needed to operate. Um, and being not weak in faith, when he was about 100 years old, verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. So in other words, for 25 years, he was at least doing some kind of staggering. But, but at, at, at 100 years old, he got a hold of it and quit staggering, quit tripping over it. And he became strong in faith giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. And therefore, it was in his account. Now, listen, folks, uh, I, what I want us to get, I, I don't know why I'm saying folks a lot here, uh, but <laughs> uh, I, what I want us to understand is that the key even though he's given us all things, the key in this is to operate by faith. 
is to, and, and again, faith in the context of saying, well, what is faith, Pastor Thad? We look at faith and we're like, well, faith is, is just believing. No, believing what? No, because, that, because all that is is an agreement. Um, James, I'm not going to turn there, but in James chapter 2, it says, even the demons believe in God and tremble. But they ain't, they ain't pulling in healing and they ain't pulling in all that kind of stuff. So faith goes beyond that. Now let's go over to Hebrews chapter 11. I, I, um, I, we're, we're, I want to get into this. Um, now again, there's a lot that, that I, I taught last week that we're going to uh, just kind of slide over here this morning. Because I want to get, I want to continue this. Just faith 101. This is, this is foundation of faith. Uh, we, we've understood what uh, th- that faith is, um, but uh, Hebrews 11. Let's uh, before we put your little book, or your little bookmark in, in 11. I want to hit this real quick here because again, I want you to see how important faith is. Um, you might want to let just do look, go to Hebrews 10. You're at Hebrews 11. Just turn to the left one page. Maybe even not turn, just look over. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, because there's four different times in Scripture this statement is used. Therefore, it's by three or more witnesses. We've got Paul um, and, and we've got Habakkuk, uh, are two different witnesses. But, um, but it, it is spoken, and, and in verse 38 it says, Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Uh, so, so faith is this important. Now, some people say, okay, well, what's faith or what's just, or what does it mean by just the just shall live by faith? Just, if you're, if you're into definitions, uh, a good old definitions, uh, uh, it, most of us have heard justified means justified, never sinned. And, and, and that's the real simple way to do it, which again, if you're justified, it means you're right with God. Just to, you know, He's taking your sins and wiped them as east as west. But I believe it's a little bit. It lacks in 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 in, in totally understanding it. I was in um, Romans. It tells us that Abraham was justified. Well, Abraham wasn't. He he did, wasn't of the blood. I mean, and I know some people maybe try to argue with me on that, but he wasn't of the blood. He wasn't after Jesus, so he wasn't justified like that. So what does ju- justified has got to have something that ties that to it. And, and I asked, I had this conversation with God one day and he just simply said, he said, really under, understand this easy. Here's, here's what justified means. Position to partake of the promises. Always have the three P's there. Position, partake, promises. So when you're justified, you're in a position for open access to the promises of God. Just as if you're never sinned, you're now in position to receive from God what he has for you. So when it says here, the just shall live by faith, it means that those that are in a position to receive all that God has promised them and have open access to all that God has promised, they're in that position because of faith. They're going to receive it because of faith. And again, uh, uh, Habakkuk actually throws in that word, the just shall live by his faith, which uh, um, Brother Carter Barnett, who's in our ministry, and, and he's, he's, uh, he's very fluent uh, as far, a very big understanding. I guess he's probably not fluent, uh, but, he, but he understands Greek really well. And he said the assumed in every, every uh, Romans 1, Galatians, I think, 3, and then Hebrews 10, the assumed in there is the just shall live by His faith, not by someone else's faith. Beloved, it's your faith you're going to live by. It's your faith you're going to walk in. And if you're going to be in a position to to enjoy the blessings of God throughout your life, it's going to come down to faith. Listen, folks, I'm telling you that if you you want the blessings of God, they've already been given to you. But your access point to them I've, I've used uh, I've used this illustration before, and I don't understand a lot of this. Some of you guys do. Um, I know enough about it to to use it as an illustration. Um, but but apparently the water, the city water, goes through neighborhoods. 
I don't know how, but they go through neighborhoods. And when you build a new house, you can build the be- most beautiful house in the world, have, you know, 700 bathrooms and, you know, whatever, a bowling alley, and have this wonderful house, and 10, 20, 30 feet from your house is this unlimited source of water but there's something you have to do. You've got to tap into it. If you don't tap into that source, it's available, it's yours. You just can't tap into it. You're just not going to have any water. And so, so the blessings of God are immense, are overwhelming. They're good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over for the child of God. But there's a lot of children of God who, though they know it and they know what's been provided, they stand, they, they get frustrated in life. Hope deferred makes a heart grow sick. Because they get they have this anxiety. Why is it not working for me? I know what God has done. Good. Devils do too. They were there on that day. They got their backside whipped. So they're familiar with what God's done. But are you fully persuaded? Are you fully persuaded that what he has promised, he will accomplish? Now we're going somewhere here. Because I know I hear, I see see so many. So yes, I'm fully persuaded, Pastor Thad. Well, good, because it'll show. I'll talk to my resident. I have two resident uh, carpentry experts, but they can both probably have the same answer. What's a surefire way to know if I've tapped into the city water thing? What's a surefire way to, to know if I did or not? (laughs) <laughs> All the ones that are not, the, 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 the professionals are going, is this a technical question? Everybody's like, no, you turn on the water and it starts pouring out. That, that's, that's, a, yeah, that's a surefire way. You know, um, th- there may be some other issues along the way, but, but if you're connected, it will show. So I'm glad that I had a lot of people say, yes, 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 I'm fully persuaded. That's good. Because that means it should be showing. And I, I hope it is. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that from a place. I'm just simply, well, let's get, let's get in. Um, all right. So, Pastor, I go to Hebrews 11 again. Uh, what do I need to do so that I walk by faith? What do I need to do? How do I need to act to know that I'm walking by faith? And, and, and the Holy Spirit told me, this a while ago, he revealed it to me different because I've never heard it taught like this. And this is, it's a shame. It's a shame. Um, This kind of, this revelation needs to get out more because we've been taught, we've been taught faith is an action. Faith is not an action. And that's our problem. That's the problem with a lot of people. Faith is not an action. And we're, I'm going to show you this here in Scripture. I have, I have a lot. I have set a couple mouth of two or three witnesses. Something's established. So the Holy Spirit's saying it. James is going to say it. Paul's going to say it. And I'm going to say it. So you got four witnesses here on, on, on behind this thing. Faith is not an action. And that's where most people get messed up. We had a, we had a pastor that was under our ministry years ago. And, and one of the reasons he's not under our ministry anymore is that this was too... He was frustrated by this concept because he looked at my dad and he said, he said, so you're telling me if I speak something a hundred times and then one time I slip up and I say something wrong, that, that, that it's, it's not going to work for me. My dad said, yep, that's what scripture says. And, and he, the guy got ticked. He was getting mad. He goes, sounds to me like God's just trying to try, trying to uh, play around with us and, 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 and play games with us. I just said, no, that's not it at all. Because what is in you is what's going to come out of you. And you can say something purposely a hundred times in a row. 
I know way too many people that wake up in the morning and they have their confessions they make. I'm healthy, I'm strong, I'm mighty, uh, my seed is mighty on the earth. And then they go through the rest of their day complaining without without realizing they're complaining. And if somebody said, if somebody said, if somebody said, uh, um, how's the confession in your mouth? Every morning I wake up. Remember, remember, remember the the testimony by Jerry Savelle where, where he, he took the, he took the recording uh, of, uh, of, Kenneth Copeland and rolled it down the street, so angry that it wasn't working for him. And he said, this thing's not working. And he goes, and and then the Holy Spirit said something like that. Well, your answer is rolling down the street. But his point was, the story goes, that the Holy Spirit started playing like a recording in him, all of the idle, worthless words that he'd spoken over his life, over his ministry, over his finances, and he wasn't, they were just part of his lingo. <laughs> and, and, and he had to come to the realization that, okay, I, maybe I got some junk in me that needs to be pushed out. Amen. All right. So, so let's, let's start here. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. And I want you to, under, you've got to see this, this un, with this understanding. Hebrews chapter 11, verse one says, faith is eventually... Faith is in the now. Faith is the now. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Now, the the word that we need to really grab a hold of there is faith is a substance. It is a thing, as they say down here. Thing. It is a substance. It is not an action. It is what we would say it's a substance. It's a noun. It is something that dwells in you. Uh, you, you, may, you may live in your house. You may clean your house. You may cook in your house. You may take naps in your house. Sleep in your house. Eat in your house. But you're you. You're a substance. But you do things. And your house will show that you do it. Uh, I hope you got that. You are a substance. But because you're a substance in that house, your house on display will show that you're a resident in there. Uh, a, a, a house without a resident will have crazy weeds and crazy grass and crazy dirt and crazy all this kind of stuff all over it. Uh, it will be unkept. But if there's a substance in their living, not, not, that, not animals, a person, then, then, then it will be manifested on the exterior and how that house looks. Well, if faith is in you, faith is a substance. <clears throat> the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, not faithfulness, it's faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. So in the same way when you were convert, when you were born again, inside of you came love. Think in terms of this. Think in terms of this. Uh, when, when you were first born again, uh, you know, it just was the most love you ever had in life. Uh, if you got born again in the church, you probably went around after that hugging people. God, I feel so good. God's been blessed, blessed me so much because it's the most love and you don't know. Why well, do I express this love? A, a substance of love, a measure of love was put in you. What do you do after that? I've seen a lot of people get born again and a week later hate the people that they that prayed for them. Because that first substance of love wasn't enough to keep them. But it's a substance. In the same way, joy comes in you, but what, what, where have you built your joy to? Faith comes in you. To every man, Romans chapter 12, to every man is given a measure of faith. When you're born again, you get a measure of faith. The substance of faith gets in you. And it will immediately, 
it'll immediately sh uh, show off by how? Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I'm a sinner. I've been, I, I've, I've been wrong. But now I choose to believe in you, to choose to believe in what you've done for me. And that faith has activated by a new life. But if that's as much faith as you ever live in, you will walk like Romans chapter 7, where it says the good I want to do, I don't do. The stuff that I don't want to do, I keep on doing, and it's a frustrating life. And most Christians think that's how life's supposed to live. I get so frustrated listening to pastors saying, even the Apostle Paul understood. The Apostle Paul knew that when he was living according to his flesh. When he was trying to operate by being the best, by, by saying, okay, I'm going to be really a man of faith this, today. I'm going to keep my confession strong, which is not bad. Keep your eye on it. I'm going to keep my confession strong. I'm going to be happy all day. And beloved, I will guarantee you that within the time between you leave the... Okay, forget that. By the time that you leave your bedroom and leave the front door, your child has done something to get on your last nerve. And that joy that I had, the world didn't give it to me, but man, my kid just stole it from me and I'm going to smack him upside the head because they stole my joy from me. Because you, you tried as hard as you could. You tried as best as you could. In other words, you are trying to operate love as an action, but love is a substance. You try to operate faith as an action, and then when you're not even thinking about it, as, um, I saw a picture on Facebook of a guy who was, who was uh, I think his kidneys were failing. And uh, and I'd never I never seen anything quite like this before in my life, but I mean he wasn't yellow he was yellow. He wasn't just it was a liver. It, w it wasn't just kind of a hue. I mean he he was low. I was like what's up with this? And just at his kidneys. He's in kidney failure. Now how how many people how, how many people know that if he would if he would have gone like this and went. I don't, want, I don't want my skin to be yellow. I don't want my skin to be yellow. I not know my skin's not yellow. I'm not going to... How, how many... He's, you're not going to wish it away. What if the doctors came in and said, here's what we're going to do. We have some foundation over here uh, from my wife's purse. And we're just going to touch up around there and we're going to try to make you look. We're going to apply makeup on the exterior of your to try to get rid of the yellow. Still not going to get rid of the yellow. But a lot of times people will, faith it's the same way. Let me go back to that. What was going on on the inside manifests on the outside. And it's not something he tried to do. And a lot of times Christians try to talk right in church. They try to talk right around other Christians. They try to talk right because I think genuinely they want to do right. But without thinking about it, it spills out that, oh, I'm sick. I'm sicker than a dog. I, why does this, this time, this time of year, this thing always gets me. I, it, it, it always, I, I remember... Um, I was reminded of up here today. I've had, um, the last couple of days, I've just kind of had this tickle in my throat, you know, uh, all that junk. And, uh, and it just annoyed me. But I was thinking about today, I thought, you know, it's been about this time of year that it was annual. My wife, my wife would attest to this. Many of you would attest to this. It, annually, I would lose my voice. I would spend, and a, and a lot of times I would, I would just because, <laughs> you guys know Pastor Thad, right? And I don't know how to go halfway in singing and in worship and stuff like that. I, if I'm going to sing, I'm going to sing loud. I'm going to sing. <laughs> I, and 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 so I would I would start I would I'd get up and I'd I'd have that little going in my mind. I I start singing. And by the time I got ready to preach, you guys remember my sermons? <laughs> I'd be preaching loud as I could. But I'd be barely coming out, and I'd be like this because that was the best I could do because at this time of year. But um, I would say every year, oh, about this time of year, 
One year, I could feel it coming on, and I think I told Jessica something like, like, uh, it's this time of year. And I could feel the Holy Spirit say, is that really what is inside of you? Do you really believe that a season has that much authority over your voice going or not going? And I'm like, no. So I said, my, my voice is strong. I can sing. And from that, it's been years since I've lost my voice. And I don't, I don't give, I don't go halfway. I don't sing lightly. I don't, I don't, oh, it's that type of thing. I'm going to, I'm going to take it easy on my voice. I'm going to give more solos to Jessica, even though I think she could do some more solos. I'm going to do some more. I'm going to let her sing longer because I want to give my voice because that preaching is important. I know a lot of people that when they start preaching too much or they preach very much, uh, they just, they, they don't want to sing. I, I am so honored that I get the privilege of doing both still. I know there, there might be the time where I just have to give up the reins. <clears throat> but it's not going to be because my voice can't, can't take it. I've got the strongest voice around. And I'm not saying that trying to pat myself on the back. I'm just simply saying my voice lasts. I could preach from here uh, until next, and I've tried, uh, until next Sunday, and my voice is not going to give out. But see what happened once I quit taking ownership of this time of year, my voice goes. Once I quit taking ownership of that. And again, was I, was I applying faith? No. It's just the inside of me, that part of it was this time. The substance of faith lives in you. And it is your job to make it grow. To see, and again, uh, you don't, yes, you can confess to change with, 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 with your mouth and with your heart. Confession is made. Uh, Romans chapter 10, it, it's a great part of that, that you can speak and it, and it helps you do it, but you're speaking the word. So yes, speaking, but you cannot fake something and, and, and it be faith. Faith is a real substance that demands real actions. Selah, go over to James chapter 2. See, the way this came to me, and, and, and I mean, for years, I just figured, here's what faith is. Faith is confession. I was preaching to, how, there's some of you, this has been a long time ago. I, I, was, I was preaching on the ingredients of faith. And I'm like, faith is confession. The next week, faith is joy. The next week, faith is uh, uh, confidence. The next week, faith is this. And I was on about on, on sermon 12 or 13 on what faith was. And, and I, I'm up here preaching and this sensation hits me. Who can walk by faith? I know not a great thing for the preacher preaching on faith to say, but I thought by the time you get your confession squared around and you're starting to work on joy, you, you got, you know, this area is, is, is waning. And then by the time you get down the road and, and, and you're working on these things, your confession, you got to get back and work on the confession. And you're, you're constantly working on these things to try, to try to have your faith work. Who can walk by faith? And then this conversation I'm having up here while I'm preaching on faith. <laughs> the Holy Spirit said, because you're looking at faith wrong. Faith is a substance that determines actions. Faith is a substance that if you have it in you, you're, 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 if it's full, if it's not full, then that's when those little f phrases, those little statements that you didn't mean to say, but to say, if it's not full, that's when those slip out because there's still some of that junk in there, still some of that unbelief in there. And so what do you need to do? You need to build your faith more and more. See, it's when, it's when, it's when your faith is not, is not maturing that, that, that you get real depressed because of your situation. And you just need to build their faith up to push out depression and bring in joy. Listen, 
the sub the substance of faith will have actions. It's funny because Hebrews chapter, if you're in James 2, stay there. But Hebrews chapter 11 starts by saying, um, faith is the substance. And then, it's, and then it goes, by that substance of faith, the worlds were framed. Uh, for by faith, by that substance of faith, they obtained a good report. The worlds were framed. Abel offered a sacrifice by faith. The, the substance that was in him caused him to give something that was greater than his brother's seed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Are, are, you, are you with me? There will be an outflow of what's on the inside of you. All right, all right. But notice here we're in James chapter 2. Oh, praise God. It's the overflow. I like that statement. It's the overflow of a forgiven soul. That's what, that's what faith is. That, that's what, you know, that's what living like a Christian is. How many people ever heard the sermons on, you know, if you're a Christian, you won't do this and you won't do that and you won't do the other. And they start, they start, they start connecting being a Christian to what you do. Being a Christian isn't what you do. It's who you are. It's a substance. It, and what you do is the overflow of what's going on inside of you. That's the way faith is. Faith isn't a substance. Faith isn't the thing you do. Faith is a substance, and then what you do is the overflow of what's in you. Amen? All right. Uh, James, are you in James 2 yet? I've been waiting for you guys, and all right, yeah, let's, let's, let's. Uh, verse 17, even so faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. I, I, I could just leave it there, except it says it time and time again. But it literally says here, faith needs works. If uh, a man says, um, I have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. In other words, you say you got faith, but you ain't doing nothing. There's nothing, there's nothing external. You can't, you can't prove you have faith. But if you've got that substance of faith, I'll show you that substance of faith by my external actions. Think about this. Which book of Kenneth Hagin do you think the woman with the issue of blood read to understand what she should read? <laughs> None. She didn't read a book. But inside of her, she had this faith thing. That it says, if I could just but touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be whole. She had this thing on the inside of her that said, Jesus is here. If I can just but touch the hem of his garment. I'll be. And it was the substance that made her fight grown men to press through the crowd. To shove through men who every man she was touching was she was making unclean. She didn't care. Because she knew. She knew the substance had overtaken her. I have, this is my hope. This is my desire. This is everything. If I may just but touch the hem of his garment, I know I'm behold. <clears throat> Guess what happened when she touched the hem of his garment? And it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't because of a book. It wasn't because the action displayed the faith. Because Jesus said, woman, your faith has made thee whole. Beloved, you can say you have faith because you have this believer. You have this, you have this agreement with the word. Well, the word of God does say by his stripes you were healed. Yes, he does. But you know what? 
just to be sure. Now again, I, God, folks, God has definitely given us doctors, physicians, medicine to help us take our stand of faith. I am not dogging that at all. I'm just saying so many people go to the, go to the doctors before they go to the Word. The Word's our answer. You know, any time that somebody writes something and it's repeated over and over again, he's really wanting you to get it. Verse 19, thou believest there's one God, good job. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou, O man, wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Hmm? Got to have the actions. Faith is not an action. Faith is a substance. (laughs) <laughs> All right, Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, and we'll talk about this in a couple weeks, I guess. It says, faith worketh by love. So if faith is our car that's taking us somewhere, it works because we put gas in the gas tank, and the gas tank is love. But here it says, if all you got is a car, sitting on, you got the substance of a car sitting on the blocks, and you're like, hey, come over here and look at my car. And everybody goes, look at your car. And oohs and ahs. And it's just sitting there, sitting in your yard. What good is that car if you can't drive it? The substance of faith is nothing if you're not putting actions to it. Pastor Thad, why are, you, why are you talking? Why are you saying this? Because we've got to understand this. What I'm going to talk about in, the, in these next few weeks, um, and I, I'm about out of time here, but, um, but the, this, is, this is six points the Holy Spirit gave me. Um, and uh, it just simply is this. Faith cometh by the word. Faith is activated by the mouth. Faith is displayed by by joy. Faith is proved through consistency or patience. Faith is sustained by confidence and faith runs by love. I got about three of the four of those in a second. I was actually saying it sarcastically. It was funny. I was talking with Jessica and I said, I mean, I could come up with a sermon right here. And I said, faith cometh by hearing and faith is activated by your mouth. And, faith, and, I, and I looked at her and I was like, okay, never mind. That's a good sermon. I'm going to preach that. So I wrote it, in my, wrote it in my notepad. But that's what we're going to talk about. If, if, you, if, you're, if you want to understand, not, not just if you have faith, but if you want to understand where your faith is, you're gonna, you, you can know it by what's coming out. If you're spending most of your time going, oh, I didn't mean to say that, then it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're a lost cause. Just build your faith. Get in the word. <clears throat> um, go to Romans 10. I'm going I'm to hit these two points here and then I'll, uh, this one point here, but these few scriptures here and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, Is there anything I missed there? I think I'm good. If you're battling things today and you need victory over it, it doesn't necessarily need to uh, mean that you need to confess more, though that wouldn't be bad. It doesn't necessarily mean you need to get more joy, even though joy is good. And does have this building benefits. It simply needs, means you need to spend, spend t- more time in the Word, spend more time with the Word, building your faith so your faith gets bigger on the inside of you and therefore your joy will be full. Is that, is that not what? I speak these things to you so that your joy will be full. All right. And your confession will flow as an overflow of a grateful heart. But over in Romans chapter 10, 
and then this is this is the first key, and I'm, I just just how I'm, I'm wording it. Six things, and we'll just hit this first one because I want to finish with this point: is that faith comes by the word. We know it's a substance, but how does it get bigger? How does it grow in the size? It grows in the size by the word. Uh, Romans chapter ten, verse seventeen says, "So then, faith comes by hearing, and hearing, and hearing the word." It does not say. Faith comes by having heard. It comes by hearing. Your job isn't to do more. It's to saturate yourself more. To get more word in you, on you, over you. Hear the word and hear it again. Well, I remember a sermon pastor preached years ago. Well, That better be be something that you're hearing today. Something that's real to you today. If you keep hearing the word, listen. This is what Romans 4 was saying, fully persuaded. You keep working the word until you are so fully convinced in the truth of the word that nothing else matters. Think about the centurion. Now, all these guys, we're going to talk, we'll talk about the woman with the issue of blood here in a week or so. We'll talk about the centurion again. But with the centurion, uh, he, he was like, man, will you come? I, my, my, my servant's at home sick, the palsy. Will you come pray for him? All right, well, and Jesus says, yeah, I'll come and I'll heal him. And the guy goes, no, listen, I'm not worthy. I'm not, I'm not a Jew. I'm not worthy that you even come and be under my roof. But if you'll speak the word only, my servant will be made whole. Now, again, my point is, what book did he read that told him all I need to do is be fully convinced in the word being spoken? He didn't, he didn't, he didn't read... There's no Kenneth Copeland books back then. There's nothing for him to read. He didn't open up, crack open a believer's voice of victory and find out, oh, if I'll just speak, if I have total confidence in the word. He said, man, listen, I am, I came to you. This is awesome. I came to you not to have you come and lay hands on him. I came to you because I recognize the authority. And when authority speaks, it happens. And I recognize your authority over sickness. And therefore, if you will speak it, that settles it. My servant will be whole. All I just need to do is hear it come from the word. Jesus is the word. In the beginning was the word. The word is with God. The word is with God. The word is with Jesus. It was Jesus. Jesus was the word. He said, all I need to do is hear the word say it. And there'll be nothing to move me off of it. Nothing ever to move me off of it. And Jesus said, seriously? I've been trying to get this through to these guys for the last couple of years. And their heads are so hard. I've not seen anybody in Israel have this understanding. But I'm going to put it in the book <laughs> so people can understand it later. Beloved, when you are so convinced in the word. That the reality of what the word of God says supersedes anything that your, that your circumstances tell you. That's when you understand. That faith. Is where it needs to be. See we get attacked or ambushed by the enemy. And the substance of faith that we have inside of us. Gets bruised. Sometimes. Uh, well let me say. Uh, the, 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 the substance that we've built up over time. Takes a hit. And the battle becomes more real than the promises. I was thinking about, uh, how many know that, that your pastor likes sports? Did anybody know that? I didn't know if you knew that or not. <laughs> God speaks to me a lot of times through sports. Um, but I was thinking about a football player who spends his whole life building up muscles. And he spends hours on the bench, hours on the curl bar, hours on the you know, push-ups and whatever, the conditioning, hours. I mean, hours every day doing that because he's getting his body ready for the game. And then he goes into a game and takes a hit. And maybe a knee goes the way it's not supposed to go or the ankle, an ankle rolls or or, a, or, or something else happens, a, a shoulder goes out or whatever. Something happens and he takes a hit and 
now that body that had been worked on for years to get to where it was at is now maybe I'm not ready to, I can't do what I was doing before. He may not be able to play the same way for a while. Does it mean he quits? Does he mean it's, it says, well, you know, I tried. It was my, I gave it my best old college try. No, it means he goes back into the gym. If there's something they need to put together, they put together, whatever. But he goes back in the gym and he starts building up the strength in that area again. So sometimes then you got the substance of faith going on inside of you. And it's, and it's operating on the inside of you. And then a battle comes. And the battle comes and it floors you. And that faith that you thought was big, thought was, it takes a hit. And maybe you realize that wasn't where I needed it to be. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe it was and it just took a hit and it kind of drew back a little bit. What do we do in that situation? We get back in the word. We, get, we, we go back into the word. We find the word. We let ourselves, we quit listening to the doctor's report. We quit, quit listening. I'm not saying that you don't follow. I'm just, we quit listening to what everybody else has to say, what the world has to say. And we allow the word of God to get bigger in us. We go and we hear the word. We hear, go, go put on a, a, a tape of, of, um, of Bill Johnson, Jesse Duplantis, uh, Jerry Savelle. You, you find, find who you listen to and just listen to it. There's one day I came in and, and some, something financial in the office kind of hit me. And I was like, amen, praise God. I'm, that's exciting. And, 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 I, and, and I, was, I didn't know what to do. So I, 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 just, I, I went on YouTube. And the first thing, usually sermons are, are someone's up there, a sermon. And the first one I saw was Jesse Duplantis. No, I think it was, I just had downloaded like their... Uh, Southwest Believers Conference. And so I saw Jesse DePlantis, didn't know what he was preaching on, a hit play. And by the time I was got done with that, I was like, yeah, yeah. He's telling God didn't ask. He said, he said God didn't tell. He, he didn't ask me, hey, did I, did I ask you to pay for it? No, I asked you to believe for it. If you can believe for it, I'll pay for it. And I was like, okay. So I, it's, not, it's not a matter of, you know, what we have in our bank account to pay that bill. Yes, I can believe for it. And it just lifted me out. In other words, I came walking in and I looked at some bill and my faith took a hit. Whew, what do I need to do? Give up? No, go find the word. Get the word. What happens if after one sermon you're still buried? Listen to another one. What happens after the second sermon if you're if you're still if you're still kind of this is the third one until you find yourself where you're going all right all right I got this thing I got this thing Amen uh, Hebrews chapter twelve verse two and we'll wrap it up with this I like. Uh, There, there's different um, TV series that Jesse and I watch together. We get home and we're, we usually watch them together. Um, <laughs> sometimes I watch half of them alone. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, one of the frustrating things about TV shows, like if, especially if it's a good drama, you know, is that I didn't get to write them. So I don't get to tell them how it finishes. And you're sitting there watching, and then and then this guy that this person, this character that you you've fallen in love with, he's one of your favorite characters. They kill him off. You're like, hold it, hold it. You didn't ask me for permission. <laughs> There's one TV show that's real popular now, and I keep hearing people online going, I I. I on my Windows 10, they have this little news thing, and I'll kick it, click it to check the weather every now and then, and I'll have this thing. Uh, this TV show's fans are upset. 
They say they won't watch it anymore because if they kill this person off. And I'm like, guess what? You didn't write the show. When you write the show, when you write the book, you get to say how it ends. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He wrote the book. Not only did he write and he'd, and he'd say how it's going to end. He's already told you. He's given you all things. He said, I've called those things that are not as they were. He said, I've spoken those things. Uh, I've called those things from the end, at the end, from the beginning. I've already said, you're healed. You're prosperous. You, you're, you're happy. I've already said, you will be saved and your household. I've already spoken. I've already written it. So what's our job? Spend time with the author. You spend time with the author, he's going to give you details on how to get to that final part. Does that make sense? See, it's, it's even more than just read the Bible or listen to a sermon. It's sit down in his presence. It's learn the intimacy of hearing his voice. Because you know what I've learned about his voice? It was all, it'll always confirm the word. And I know the, confirm, the word will confirm the voice. I, I understand that. But it will never hang on its own. So if you're facing a financial situation and, 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 uh, and you know what the word says, given will be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken. You know what the word says, that, that whatsoever things you sow, you'll reap. And, and, that, and, and, and the word is like, okay, I'll do that. I'll, I'll bring my tithe to the storehouse. Then I'll maybe meet in mine house. Um, and you understand what it says, but then you get in the quietness of just loving on him. And him speaking secrets. And he'll say, Jessica, do this. Neil, do this. And from the overflow of a heart of faith, the actions will come. And the works will prove the faith, which will bring the harvest. Amen. Let's stand together. I've got so much. I, I struggled today because I realized that the point I'm going to start on next week um, is is deeper <laughs> than than like like a portion of a script a sermon could even get to. Um, and so I don't know how we're going to cover things. I think it's just going to be whatever the Holy Spirit leads me. I, I did not follow my notes exactly today. Just kind of. But beloved, faith is a substance that's growing in you. It grows by the word and it grows through by spending time with the word. And when your faith when your faith is where it needs to be. Listen, folks, if, 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 your, if your answer is, I need three feet of a mustard seed of faith. Faith is like the grain of mustard seed that grows. And if your faith needs three feet of mustard seed and you're at two feet of mustard seed, you need to grow. Your faith needs to grow. Does that make sense? I usually talk about currency, but I'm using a different analogy here. If it needs five feet and you're at four feet, your job is just to grow. Don't, don't tell me it doesn't work. My cash works every time I have enough. 
<laughs> right? I can't go. I can't go into some place that with with five dollars and something that costs ten dollars and go. Eh, this store doesn't work. No, it works exactly. If I got ten dollars, it's gonna. What happens if I only have five dollars? I need to go accumulate. I need to build. So I'm just simply saying, beloved, that I don't. I don't know what you're believing for. I don't know how long you've st stood. Keep standing. Recognize you've got faith. I'm not doubting you have faith. You're here this morning. You've accepted Jesus into your life. You've got that substance of faith. Just keep working at seeing it grow. Keep getting it bigger. And watch the, watch the things that you've been believing for manifest. Amen? Heavenly Father, I love you. <clears throat> I'm so grateful for you. I'm grateful for your promises. And Father, the thing with your promises are that they never fail. They never stop short. Unfortunately, sometimes we do. And your promises, see, if faith was an action, then we could work ourselves into an answered prayer. Oh, so I just have to say something 1,500 times and, you know, it'll be fine. But because it's a substance that only grows by your word. And when your word becomes ultra real to us, and our actions are an overflow of that word. Then the manifestation comes from your word. Not from our actions. And so your gifts, your promises are real. As Pastor Elise has been talking about, get real. They're real. Well, Father, for us to tap into it, we've got to put that faith in action. We've got to build our faith through the word. So it becomes more real to us than any battle we're facing. I love you, Dad. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you.